jump right on into our Hearing Up Provider Spotlight. Today we've got Dr. Yasmin Batat. She graduated from Salus University and she has been practicing audiology for 20 years. She's a provider at Oracle Hearing Center in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. And in addition to her clinical work, she also works for Hearing the Call, which is an organization that provides local and international humanitarian hearing healthcare. Um, she's also a mother, a wife, an avid hiker, and a killer volleyball player. <laughs> and uh, she told me earlier today that her favorite part of her job is just watching her patient's inner light shine through their better hearing and more meaningful human connection. And I thought that was a really sweet sentiment. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Vatat, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you guys. Great, awesome. so we're on the topic here about noise-induced hearing loss. Um, tell us just how often are you running into patients that have noise-induced hearing loss how commonly does this come up in clinic for you? It's funny, I'm seeing a lot more young people come in and usually it's, we're getting a call, they need to get in right away because they were at a concert recently, they were near the speakers and now they have, they're experiencing hearing loss, but more disturbing than that, they're experiencing tinnitus. And the problem with that is that it's not allowing them to sleep at night, they're feeling depressed, they're feeling anxious, they don't know what's wrong. They, know, they don't know how to resolve it. So um, a lot of younger people who are having this kind of noise exposure, we are seeing them and we're trying to educate them as to, well, well, how can we protect ourselves? How can we go and enjoy ourselves at a concert and protect our hearing so that we don't go through this? Obviously there's rehabilitative measures for addressing their hearing loss and their, tin their tinnitus, but there's also you know, an educational and, and protective measure that we're taking as audiologists. So when you start talking about, and it, with younger individuals, you start talking about mm -hmm. using hearing protection and things like that, what type of hearing protection do you typically lean towards with maybe a younger individual versus an older individual that's trying to protect their hearing? I really liked um, taking impressions and fitting a lot of my patients with musicians plugs that have different levels of filters 10 decibel, 15 decibel, 25 decibel filters, and they can switch them out at, um, according to how much more volume or less or more protection that they, they want. Um, and I've been just getting such a great response from something like that um, in that they'll come back and say, you know, I was still able to hear the music. I didn't think I could hear the music, um, but I didn't have the ringing. I didn't have that feeling of um, feeling like I'm underwater afterwards. And so it's, it's just wonderful to be able to provide that kind of solution um, to, to people like that. And then, and then we also talk about, you know, wearing AirPods and, and how to enjoy our music while wearing AirPods. And a lot of times those conversations lead to, well, why are you turning up your AirPods? And they'll say something like, I don't wanna hear the sounds around me. I really wanna enjoy my music. And maybe we'll segue or we'll talk about, well, how about getting a set of um, you know, headphones that have noise canceling features so that you don't have to pump up your music so loud and you could simply enjoy that without having background noise interfere with your music listening experience. So a lot of it is just educating and trying different options and, and then we're open to it and it, it's a great conversation. That's a really good point. I mean, uh, if they, it, let's say that they don't comply with those recommendations, which we know, you know, or, or the damage has already been done. Uh, you had talked about, you like to do custom impressions. So uh, what does that look like for someone who is considering doing some hearing protection and they're thinking that this custom option that you're talking about is really nice. Can you talk to them about the impression process for that? I, I, I really care about taking um, and, and edu educating and telling people what what it, what goes into a really good um, ear mold impression, whether it be for music plugs or hunters, um, you know, hunting protection or um, or any or sleep plugs. And a lot of it comes down to a, the basics of of um, making sure that when we do take protections with uh, I'm sorry impressions with. Um, our impression gun or our you know, syringe using the two-part silicone, making sure that we're getting a sealed ear canal, making sure that when we as audiologists are taking that impression, we're covering 
um, the landmarks that are important to seal up that ear mold so that sound does not uh, make its way into the ear canal. And just a little leak can actually affect how, how well you're protected. You guys know this. So um, I tell people, I think, even me, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want to say it's more important than the actual ear mold that you're wearing, but the impression and how it's taken and making sure that it is covering all the landmarks and getting a good seal at the canal portion is so important in ensuring that you have um, good, good hearing protection when exposed to loud sounds. Totally. You know, it kind of makes me think, I don't know if you guys have seen this, Dr. Batat, Dr. Cook, but I've seen some TikTok videos where there's some really bad impressions being taken yeah. on TikTok. Oh and, I, and I'm thinking along the lines of exactly what you're saying is that if you were to send that in to an ear lab to get a custom protector made, that would be horrible. Yeah. So it really yeah. comes down yeah. to actually making sure that you're taking an impression the right way. And there's best practices when it comes into taking impressions. And there's also best practices when it comes down to treating a hearing loss that has had noise exposure and tinnitus on top of that potentially. Um, you're part of the Hearing Up Provider Network, and that's why we're doing this segment right now. So in case any viewers are not familiar, the Hearing Up Provider Network is a group of hearing care professionals who are committed to following best practices uh, when preventing hearing loss and treating hearing loss. So why was it so important for you to come on board with Hearing Up, and, and what do best practices mean to you? I think the most important part of it for me as, as an audiologist is if I don't have a way of measuring my outcomes, a way of measuring the fitting, um, then I don't know if you're actually making progress. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do in the office is getting an initial test, a full battery, a very comprehensive test. And then as, as you are fit, as we follow up with you, actually double checking those results to see that our scores, our performance is improving. If I don't have a way of checking to see whether or not these these devices are working properly, or if that if you're hearing soft conversational loudspeech at 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 the targeted levels, how do I know you know what what I'm doing and whether or not we're making progress? I tell people hearing aids are a care and maintenance game, but before that, they are a service game. If we don't if we don't provide service, if we don't check our service, if we don't measure our service, how do we know? It's kind of like it's like voodoo audiology, you know, you're walking around in the dark and hoping something's going to work out. Sometimes it might, and a lot of times it might not. Just so important to verify and validate what you are doing. And like you said, otherwise you're just taking a shot in the dark, and that's probably not going to be good for anybody. And so. unfortunately, that's the majority of hearing care that's out there right mm -hmm. now is where you know, people are just getting hearing aids slapped on their ears and they say, how does that sound? And that's pretty much the end of it right there. Um, so we commend you for what you do and your commitment to best practices, both before and during your time as a network member. Most definitely, most definitely. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Patat. Can you please tell viewers where they can find you? We're located in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Um, if you wanted to get any more information about what we do and how we care about our patients, how we love on them, um, you can find us at oraclehearingcenter.com. We also have YouTube handles. You could look up Oracle Hearing Center on YouTube, on Facebook, on um, Instagram and TikTok. We're active on all those channels and we love to post educational material that help that helps raise awareness for hearing and hearing care. Awesome. Dr. Batat, thank you so much for joining us. That was awesome. It was for sure. She's I mean great. You can, it, that's the thing with a lot of uh, Hearing Up Network members is that a lot of them have been following best practices for years, possibly decades, depending right. on how long they've been an audiologist. And it happens to be a lot more private practice audiologists because they get to dictate their own schedule since yeah, following timing. best practices takes a lot of time. Um, it's hard to do that in a lot of different type of uh, settings uh, when you get treated with hearing mm -hmm. aids. And we've talked about it with you uh, coming from the ENT setting. Right. We've talked about it in hospital settings, big box stores, things of that nature. It's just very hard to find providers in those settings who are allowed to follow best practices. <laughs>